Welcome to quintessential 90s music, songs that live and move us today. I'm Clarice with Studio Expresso, and we meet the, with the creators in the studio. Today, joining us is Ken Allardyce, producer, mixer, engineer from, and uh, more recently, studio owner and label owner from beautiful Scotland. Hi, Ken. Hi, Clarice, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Ken uh, has worked with uh, Weezer, Goo Goo Dolls, and of course, Green Day. And he's joining us from True North um, uh, Studios. And uh, we're gonna talk about time of your life. Uh, Good uh, Riddance is a song by Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day, uh, from their uh, album, uh, Nimrod, that was released by Reprise in 97. It sports about 600,000 streams, which is platinum in UK, and the album has gone double platinum in US. Um, it, the song uh, is different. Uh, it's a departure from their punk rock roots. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, so it's different in repertoire and it's also, uh, it brought them uh, to mainstream music, and you were there during the recordings, Ken. Tell me a little bit how that album got on uh, this, uh, the, I mean, the song got on the album. Um, well, when we recorded Nimrod, we went into Studio C at Conway for quite a long time and recorded a bunch of songs. We recorded, I think, either 28 or 30 songs the idea being that they wanted to evolve and so they, they just wanted to throw out all, all the sort of ideas that they got in the in the closet and then pick up the pieces and, and see what would make it on the record. And so we banged down, about, as I say, about 30 songs of which Time of, Time of Your Life was one. And uh, it was actually done remarkably quickly because it wasn't didn't involve the band. It was just Billy. And he was basically on an acoustic guitar. And I think, as I remember it, it was one take. I'm pretty sure it was one take, two false wow. starts and then one take, and that was it. And um, then it was put in the, in the bank while we continued recording. And then at the end of the recording of the 30 odd songs, um, the, the band and Rob Cavallo, the producer, picked the ones they wanted to work on. And that was one of them. And, Rob had the inspired idea of putting strings on it and which really transformed it. And uh, the rest is history, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit about, was it the first time you worked with Green Day or Rob or how did, how did you all get together? Yeah, it was the first time I'd worked with Green Day. I'd worked with Rob prior to that. I'd met Rob um, probably the previous year working with uh, he Rob was Lindsay Buckingham's a and guy at Reprise Records amongst his other roles and one of the things he endeavoured to do was to get Lindsay out of his home studio into a real studio with different musicians because he'd basically been working by himself for quite a number of years and um, Mick Fleetwood was uh, in, enlisted to play drums and Mick being a, I'd been working with him quite a lot just prior to that. So he asked if I could engineer. And so I did, and that's where I met Rob and we sort of hit it off. And then subsequently to that, he actually, before Green Day, we did another album. I recorded uh, Cara's Flowers that, who turned into Maroon 5, uh, an album called The Fourth Is the Fourth Estate, Fourth World, I can't remember what it's called, Fourth World, I think. And uh, we did that. And then subsequent to that, he asked me to do to, to Green Day with him. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk a little bit about the song and how, uh, you know, Rob introduced strings with David Campbell, uh, which is not really a punk rock idea. Were the boys uh, behind that and how did that come about? And um, Yeah, I think, I think they were definitely behind it because let's face it, the song was hardly a punk song either. So I think just to go completely against the grain kind of served them. And so to come out with a ballad and then to put strings on it and, and not cheesy in any way, the strings, I mean, they were very complimentary. 
but it was definitely a twist for them. And so, um, yeah, I think it, in that respect, it, it worked. They were, you know, they, for them, they were sort of breaking new territory, if you like. Yeah, a breakup ballad. And uh, like Mike Durnt has been quoted to say that um, in a way was the most punk thing they could have done is put strings on it. So, uh, you know, and the boys yeah. were at the time uh, also fighting with the idea of, I think, uh, you know, their, their fan base, uh, the punk fan base uh, was very much against them signing with a major label and kind of doing this big production and, and uh, they went against that. But uh, in, in the end, they came around and, uh, um, you know, it became a song, became uh, popular with proms, graduations, funerals. Um, it was uh, featured on a season nine of Seinfeld here in U.S., it's a popular TV show. Wow. And uh, did, did uh, Billy Joe, who wrote the song, did he talk much about the inspiration or did he want to make sure that gets on the album or anything? Do you remember that? No, I, I really didn't have any sense of that at all. I mean, when he, when he did it, I mean, basically we just recorded it fairly quickly, as I, as I just said, and uh, he didn't really, um, make any comment about it and it is almost as if he felt it was a throwaway that's the sense I got at the time I, I really didn't feel like he actually thought it would make it particularly maybe he did I don't know but didn't there was no big fanfare about it not at all and it was yeah. um it was really I think when Rob it, the my understanding was Rob saw the potential and when he came up with the idea to put strings on then it then it sort of got a second life if you like you know why do you That's think the, the song, yeah, I guess it was a song written for his girlfriend who moved away um, some time back. And so it sort of, it's, it resurfaced itself. But it also, um, why do you think it's connecting to our times? You know, 20 years later, um, still lives with us. And, uh, you know, part of it is, uh, I don't know if you know about this uh, cancel culture in U.S., and uh, yeah. Billy Joe has said that punk rock invented cancel culture. So, you know, that's kind of funny. In a way. Yeah, well, well, the, the, first, the first part of your question, why do I think it's still sort of resonating? I think, I think um, Billy, Billy Joe is a very sort of visceral artist. He's, he's what you see is what you get, you know, he's very direct. And him doing this song on an acoustic guitar is kind of as direct as it gets, you know, voice and guitar. There's, so it's a, a, an immediate connection. And it's got this timelessness about it as a song. And I think the fact that it has this lovely string arrangement is just makes it into a classic song. And it's, it's a, a sort of real vital artist at his most essential, you know, and so I think that's the connection for me is really it. Yeah. It's like, it's as close as you're going to get to a, to a real authentic artist, you know? Yeah. And so it sort of just lives on. The sincerity. Um, so yes. what was their vibe like, you know, before they were inducted to a rock and roll hall of fame? I mean, it, there was, there were still a young band, Talk a little bit about their musicianship. I know uh, Billy's dad was a jazz drummer, and yet he said that he thought that Trent Poole was one of the best drummers that he knew. How were they as musicians? Uh, incredible. I mean, they, they each play their instrument in a unique stylized way. I mean, none, none of them really plays like anyone else. And so they're all very unique players. And somehow it all adds up and they come together as one and they are incredibly tight as one. Uh, something to behold when they're in full flow, it's, it's unbelievable. And Trey particularly, I mean, in the studio, he's just mesmerizing watching this guy playing, he's unbelievable. And um, yeah, very high, very high level of, of musicianship. You're super tight band, one of the tightest bands I've worked with without a doubt, I mean, really, really tight and uh, very high octane, high energy stuff. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a high wire act and it's, it's yeah. pretty brilliant. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, you know, Ken, uh, when the band uh, Green Day uh, really uh, blew up on an indie label called Lookout from uh, Northern California, and now you have your own label called In Time, tell me a little bit about your label and artist development, what you've been doing lately. Well, basically the label came about as a result of uh, running into a really talented band and we live in the north of Scotland and all of us and they live really far north and so the logistics of doing it from where they are are pretty grim and I felt I mean I've got a studio in my home and I felt with my experience I could really help these guys and uh, really wanted to help them because I mean I, I see the talent and um, so really that's why we started the label myself and a partner to, as a vehicle to try to get these guys up and running. And once we'd started the label, we thought, well, this is, you know, the, the sort of uh, ethic of the, of, the lab, of the label is to really help give something back, help young talent to, to develop. I mean, I'm very much pro artist, obviously. And um, so it's, it just feels that at this point in my life, a real chance to, to give back and, and it's very rewarding. I'm actually into a whole new, phase doing it, something I've never really done, you know, so it's, um, no, it's great. It's real, really yeah. fun. So the boys are called Forgetting the Future and uh, they have an EP out uh, that can an album, in, An album, in fact. An, an album. Uh, yeah, we did, we did an album cool. and we're working on five new songs at the moment, which probably going to get released one at a time, as is the way at the moment. Right, right. Anyway, so, um, you know, uh, you can definitely look them up on In Time Records, uh, YouTube, great videos, and uh, look up also Ken um, on In Time or uh, Studio Expresso. Uh, Ken, talk a little bit about um, the song, maybe even about serendipity and life, you know, and how your journey began as an engineer um, first at Bill Schnee's and then Ocean Way where we met and then you went solo. Um, was right. that faith? Was it, um, or did you create your path, you know, with power of intention? What was it? How well, did I, I, I don't know if um, faith and the power of intention may be uh, intertwined in some way. I'm not really sure, but I seriously believe in if you want something strongly enough, it's within your power to get it. If you prepared to put the work in and, and have right. the desire. And I think in, in my case, as far as engineering, I, I was working with Roger Hodgson from Supertramp before I got in, into engineering as a sort of, I came over with Supertramp to the States and I was a sort of musical sidekick of his and he was doing a solo album and, and uh, Jack Quigg, Jack Joseph Quigg, came and engineered a record for Roger. And at the end of it, he basically turned around to me and said, you should have done this record. You have the skill sets that it takes to, to make records, you know? And uh, I, I sort of didn't really believe him or thought he was, mm -hmm. you know, didn't really quite understand what he was saying. But shortly thereafter, I got asked to make tapes by a bunch of local artists and I'd never done that. And I, I, I did two of them and suddenly realized that this is exactly what I should have been doing all along. So I was actually quite good at something for a change, you know? So um, Jack had said he'd help me and he subsequently did. And, uh, but it took a long time, you know, cause he said, you know, good jobs in LA really don't grow on trees. And <laughs> so it was six months after our, you know, when he made this offer to me and uh, in the interim, uh, I sort of decided I wanted to work for Bill Schnee, being I regarded him as the best engineer I, I'd heard of or knew of. And then um, I wanted to work at Oceanway because that was the best studio. And um, so I sort of put that out into the ether and then I chased it. And guess what? Both, both jobs came to me. So you could call it fate, you could call it whatever desire or good fortune, I would say good luck, but sort of a, a kind, of, kind of an eye-opening experience. Be careful what you wish for, you know, dreams can come true. 
so yeah <laughs> well well put. well put um so we should also give honorable mentions to the mixer of the song richard dodd and then chris lord algae mixed the album but you recorded the entire album and yes uh, and it's a long uh, there are many songs and um you know very yeah we were i think i think we were three month recording um pretty much i think it was pretty much three months or even a bit longer so quite a long time yeah very cool but a um, lot of fun a lot of fun and it's all about having fun and having time of your life so uh thank you for joining us <laughs> I, yeah maybe we, maybe we did <laughs> Big shout out to our sponsor, Trans Audio Group, who uh, provides high-end gear for recording studios. Um, and uh, now I have one last question. And uh, because you you lived in uh, Los Angeles for a long time, but you've sort of lost your Scottish accent. So tell me what's your favorite breakfast in Scottish accent? My favorite breakfast in a Scottish accent is porridge and then a kipper. <laughs> I never actually had a Scottish accent even when you, even before I went to the States. You never did? How come? Because I I grew up all around the world. I'm a military brat. Ah <laughs> that's right. You always talk to me about your travels all over the world, Middle East, yeah. you know, you've been, you've been yeah. everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was born on the rock of Gibraltar. So I was a rocker from the beginning. Beginning? <laughs> That's I, cool. I've lived in Malaya, I've lived, I've lived all over the place. I've lived in 40 homes, Clarice. Wow, 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 wow. Very cool. And I've been to 12 schools by the time I was nine years old. Yeah, such as military life, and that was your dad, huh? I I know another yeah, military. Well, it... Yeah. No, no, they moved on every two years, basically. So you know, you're always, always changing. Yeah. Well, happy travels, and thanks for joining yeah. us again. Yeah, thanks for doing that, Chris. Lovely, and um, yeah, happy travels. Unfortunately, not too many travels at the moment, but. Uh, right, right. <laughs> well, maybe with the mask. Are you guys out of lockdown now? We we're California is doing really well so far. So um, yeah. we are, um, you know, U.S. is about sixty percent vaccinated, at least with the first dose, and so it's pretty relaxed. You know, California says, you know, if you've been vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask. I still do just well, to be safe and be respectful, but you know, yeah, not a big deal. Well, we we've, we've got um, ten miles down the road. We've got an outbreak of the Indian variant. Aye, yes. So, ten mi well, ten miles away, away. Stay away from that. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not allowed. We're not allowed to go there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Gonna check back in. Bye. All righty. Take care. Bye.